Hello and welcome to this video service from St David's. I trust this finds you well and sitting comfortably, perhaps in a favourite chair, with calmness and peace in your soul. Such moments are exquisite, aren't they? And yet we know that challenges and trouble are never far away, and all too often they are all too present. What has shaken you in this past week, this year, in your painful memories? What rattles you right now? What may shake you in the days ahead? Well, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, our hope, that's our certain expectation, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Where there is suffering in the life of the follower of Jesus, there will also be comfort it will come. That is an unshakable hope and a sure promise. May we enter into more of that divine comfort as we meet with the Lord together today. Behind every great hymn, there is usually a great story and often a great tragedy. Let me share one of those with you now, yet as you listen, remember that our goal is true comfort. That's where we're heading. In the city of Chicago, in 1861, Horatio Spafford married Anna Larson. Horatio served as a dedicated elder in their Presbyterian church he was a successful senior partner in a large law firm and a real estate investor. Their family grew over the next decade and filled their home on the north side of the city where they hosted many guests and Christian gatherings. However, grief struck with the loss of their first child and only son, Horatio II who succumbed to pneumonia in 1871. That same year, the Great Fire of Chicago wiped out all of Horatio's real estate assets, leaving him financially ruined. Horatio and Anna Spafford decided that they and their four daughters were in need of a rest and a trip away from these sorrows, and so they put together enough funds for a voyage to Europe. Horatio also hoped that he would be able to help his friend, the preacher D.L. Moody, on his evangelistic tour of Great Britain. Last minute business caused Horatio to be delayed, and so he sent his wife and their daughters on ahead, promising to follow on another ship in a few days. On the 22nd of November, 1873, as the SS Ville du Havre was carrying Anna Spafford and the four girls across the Atlantic, it was struck by another vessel and sank in 12 minutes. Several days later, the survivors were delivered to Cardiff in Wales. Horatio had learnt of the tragedy and was eagerly waiting to hear what had become of his family. It was then that he received Anna's now famous telegram that began with these two solemn words, Saved Alone. With this message in his hand, Spafford realised that his four young daughters had all been lost at sea. Annie, Maggie, Bessie and Tanetta. Several weeks later, 
Spafford set out on his own journey across the ocean to meet his grieving wife. And as his ship passed near the spot where his daughters had died, he sat down and wrote the words of this hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Paul says, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Let's worship our Saviour as we sing in this wonderful hymn.
Let us now approach the Lord in prayer. Let us all pray. God of all might and all holiness, we come now together into the wonder of your presence. We worship you as the one who is always still in your unchanging nature and yet completely active in all your sovereignty over your creation. Help us even now to be quiet before you and give us grace to believe that you are engaged with every fibre of our being and every aspect of our souls and every detail of our existence. We bring before you those shocks, those disappointments, those pains, those losses that shake us to the core, that cause us to toss and turn in our beds, that distract us and consume so much of our thoughts through the day. And we thank you that there is wholeness to be found in you. There is healing, there is restoration, something that we enter into in this life and will be complete and perfected when we enter the life to come. And yet, Lord, you tell us that what ought to make us tremble most of all is our sin for which Jesus died. If this is what forgiveness cost, the price of Calvary, then how heinous must our offences be? And so we confess this guilt now from the most obvious of our selfishness that is seen by all to our most hidden, inordinate desires in the corners of our souls. We pray for and joyfully receive your promised pardon and we ask for your transforming spirit Make us clean today through the word you speak to us. And so may we know more of the unshakable hope we are given in our suffering, that there is indeed true comfort, profound comfort in Jesus. For if he can deal with the eternal suffering we deserve by taking it upon himself on the cross, if he can deliver us from that, then surely he is constantly occupied in bringing us through all our temporal suffering also. And so may we cherish and adore and abide in him, and may we know more of the peace and the hope and the assurance and the security you have given us in him as you minister to our hearts in this service. Hear this, our prayer which we ask in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Horatio Spafford could have certainly been on a voyage to despair when he set out to cross the Atlantic following the tragic loss of his four precious daughters at sea. And yet he met Jesus afresh in all the promises of the gospel in a very profound way, in all his goodness and mercy. Horatio needed to experience the comfort of Jesus again and again. He and Anna suffered further grief with the loss of another subsequent child. And the trauma of all their experiences inflicted wounds that they struggled with and that were never fully healed 
in this life. Our theme today is meeting Jesus on the road to despair. Sometimes we're accelerating down that road at a terrifying pace. Other times we may be wandering onto it and feeling how it begins to trip us up again. At any time, we can easily have at least one foot treading that path. And the wonderful thing is that Jesus comes along this very road to meet us and to reveal who he is and what he has done and what he will do for us. Our Bible reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7 and verses 11 to 17. It follows upon the healing of the centurion's servant. Luke 7, verses 11 to 17. Let us hear the very word of God. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and... God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading of his most holy and infallible word and give us understanding and comfort from it today. In a few moments, some words will appear on your screen. They are the first question and answer of the Heidelberg Catechism. And this is an opportunity for you and me to confess our faith in the gospel in response to God's word. I'll ask the question and I invite you to respond with me in the answer. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. With such truths and comforts given to us, let us come and seek our Father's blessing for ourselves, for others, for all the world, as we unite before him in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we call to your open ear. We appeal to your loving heart. We claim your gracious promises as we pray to you now as your children together. We hear so much in the news of what 
might be a way out of the coronavirus, a way out of the lockdown, but there are so many factors, so many uncertainties. We can't know if the worst of the pandemic is behind us or ahead of us. And yet you know, O Lord, you oversee and direct all things. And so we pray to you for the well-being of our community, of our country, of our world, for healing for the sick, for relief for the distressed, for comfort for the bereaved, for discernment for the leaders, for protection and endurance for medical and aid workers. Even though we know these are right and good things to pray for, we recognise that very often we must travel further down the road to despair than we realise before we meet the Lord of life. And so help us to accept that an end to the pandemic is not the highest end. It is meeting and knowing and trusting and following Jesus. This is the highest end. And this comes through trials and circumstances in which we learn of our weakness, of our waywardness, so that we will welcome your power and your forgiveness. Work revival, we pray, spiritual renewal in our hearts and in all the nations of the world. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in every land, in their local neighbourhoods, on mission fields, in each location, and for the people that surround us and them. Use us and them to intercede, to live the gospel, to present the gospel, and may the number of Christian conversions far exceed the number of coronavirus cases, so that in all things Christ may have the preeminence, as he surely will. We pray for our daily needs. Help us to nurture our souls in the fellowship of your word and of prayer. Help us to be faithful and loving husbands and wives in our marriages. Help us to be godly examples to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. May they see the wisdom and joy of Jesus in us, and may we bring his truth and mercy into their lives. We ask that you would give us patience and tenderness, forgiveness and reconciliation in our relationships, wherever you would grant these blessings, and give us grace to bear with the brokenness and pain when relationships are not restored. May we know that Jesus is always faithful and that we are defined by our relationship with him, by everything that it means to be in Christ, united to him forever. And so may we find our identity and worth and purpose in Jesus deep deep love for us, in whose name we pray. Amen.
In London, in the year 1665, the citizens were enjoying the warm and comfortable weather. The harvests of the surrounding countryside and the economy of the city looked forward to a promising and fruitful season. But this pleasant English scene was all about to change. A disease known as the Black Death was already knocking at the door and soon the population was ravaged by what is forever known as the Great Plague of London. 100,000 people died. That was one in every five of the population. The writer Daniel Defoe recorded how the whole city became abandoned to despair. Each evening, open carts would be pulled around the city and the cry would be heard, Bring out your dead. Families, overcome with grief, watched as their loved ones were carried away to be thrown into mass graves. The doors of their homes were marked with a red cross in order to warn passers-by not to enter a plague house. And with the cross were written these words, Lord, have mercy on us. And at last the Lord did. The plague suddenly stopped as quickly as as it had begun. Defoe writes, in the middle of their distress, when the condition of the city of London was so truly calamitous, just then it pleased God, as it were, by his immediate hand to disarm this enemy. The poison was taken out of the sting. It was wonderful. Even the physicians themselves were surprised at it. Wherever they visited, they found their patients better, so that in a few days, everybody was recovering. Whole families that were infected and down, that had ministers praying with them and expected death every hour, were revived and healed, and none died at all out of them. We cannot imagine what it must have been like to live in a community where the daily burial carts went up and down the streets, calling to people, bring out your dead. We have such conveniences as the regular garbage trucks and the home ice cream man rings his bell. Occasionally, we have a council street sweeper. Until recently, we even had a fisho who came by once a fortnight. Many of us can recall the days of the milkman and of Mr. Whippy. I remember hearing about one family where the mother convinced the children that Mr. Whippy only played that sad tune, Green Sleeves, when he was all out of ice cream. So there was no need to go chasing him. And yet, even without death carts, day by day in our streets, a plague of despair covers our society. Scholars tell us that we live in an age of unparalleled health and prosperity, and that remains true even in spite of the current circumstances. And people in this age are overall unhappier and more depressed than they were in the 17th century when Defoe was writing, or in all the Middle Ages before it. We have so much more and we live longer with a far higher quality of life. And yet inside the homes of our city, people are eaten up by disappointment and dissatisfaction. It was in another balmy spring, in the second year of the ministry of Jesus, that the events of Luke chapter 7 took place. The earth seemed to be brimming with new life and everywhere the Saviour went, the cup of goodness and mercy overflowed. Each day, Jesus revealed deeper sympathy and demonstrated greater power. And this brought fresh surprise and new gladness to his growing band of followers. Just the day before, it had been the joy of the centurion 
to have his servant healed and made whole. And now on this day, Jesus was leaving Capernaum, the scene of that miracle, and making his way to another city called Nain. The disciples and a large crowd were following him. The way was long, more than 25 miles. And as the hours passed, the multitude and the evening approached the city together. Everyone was wondering and whispering about what might happen next as Jesus continued his ministry. As they drew near from the east, they passed a burial ground. And then they saw the rich gardens and the orchards for which the city was well known. The word Nain means pleasant, and indeed it was, a beautiful setting in the hills of Galilee. It seemed so incongruous then that they should hear the sound of a mournful horn and of wailing women ahead of them. For just then, coming out of the city was a funeral procession headed by a poor and distraught widow. She was very dishevelled and she had rent her garment as a sign of her grief. Her husband was dead and now she was about to bury her only son. The funeral dirge was played on flutes and cymbals. Hired mourning women chanted the lament. An orator went before, proclaiming the good deeds of the dead. But in all this painful pageantry, there was no thought for the widow, bereaved of her husband and now bereft of her only son. The procession had started from her simple and now desolate home. The carefully groomed and prepared body was carried aloft on a bier that's like a stretcher, an open coffin of wickerwork. Different friends and neighbours, all barefoot, rotated in the task of being the four pallbearers. It was the custom for the woman, in this case the widow, to walk in front of the bier. For it was said that it was the first woman, Eve, who introduced death into the world, quite forgetting about Adam's responsibility. Therefore, a woman must lead a dead body to its grave in shame. Sorrow upon sorrow. Behind the bier walked the relatives and friends and the congregation. One at a time, when someone wanted to give a eulogy, he would walk up to the bier and touch it. That was the sign, the signal. And noticing it, the pallbearers would stop and place the bier on the ground. The mourner would then speak. Joe was a man who feared the Lord, a good neighbour and an honest friend. He shall be sorely missed. Hmm. And so the procession would resume with the beer being raised and carried along until the next person came and touched the beer. And again, it was laid on the ground and everyone stood around to Listen to the next tribute being made. And so it was, on this road outside the city of Nain, that these two multitudes met, one headed by the Lord of life and the other by a dead man being carried to his grave. Life and death meet face to face. And how did Jesus respond? Which of the two would give way to the other, life or death? The expectation would have been for Jesus and the crowd with him not only to stand aside and make way, but to pause and to share in the solemn moment as respectful strangers. However, we're told that when Jesus saw the widow, he had compassion on her. Without a husband or a son, this woman would be destitute. She would have no security in this world. She had lost her family and she had lost her income. She had lost everything. And yet, 
the face of the Saviour, strong and understanding and thoughtful, looked intently into hers, worn and sad and tearful. Jesus said to her, do not weep. Dear lady, don't despair. And then to the amazement of all, Jesus walked up to the bier and he touched it and the pallbearers set it down. His followers watched with curiosity and interest. The mourners wondered, perhaps this is a cousin or a friend who has just heard the news and has come now at this last hour to pay his respects. And so they bent their ears to listen to the eulogy of this newcomer, now standing by the body lying on the ground. And yet Jesus did not address the crowd, but he turned and he spoke to the corpse on the bier. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And then stirring as if out of a deep sleep, the man blinked hard and raised himself up on his elbow and looked all around him. And his eyes opened wide as he realised that he found himself awakened at his own funeral. And yet the eyes of the mother opened wider still as she and everyone else looked on in astonishment and an audible gasp was heard all around and then we're told that the young man began to speak imagine what he would have said what's what's going on <laughs> oh mum you look so sad i didn't think you'd miss me that much <laughs> and so we are told jesus presented him to his mother what a reunion this miracle was important enough in the personal lives of this family. It was a remarkable experience in the town of Nain. And yet this event has great significance for all the world and all history. For there is a very real sense in which all of humanity was present in that funeral procession. This is where we are. This is where life leads. It leads to grief and loss, to death and to despair. And the Lord of life meets us and transforms it all. We're not told the name of the dead young man. However, I like to think of him as being called Adam. Why? Because he represents us all. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. That is, all those who believe in Christ. Death and life meet outside name. And who wins? Those who are dead in Adam does death have the last word? No, it is life. There is new and powerful life in Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Why is our journey through this world so hopeless? Well, because it is a funeral procession. That's where we're all heading. It has been said that the last place we can picture ourselves is lying in a coffin. The last event we want to imagine is our own funeral. And yet nothing is more certain. Where is this life heading? It is heading out of the city of Nain, out of your home and to the cemetery. Why are people crying? Because of sin and separation? Why are people grieving? Because of disappointment and death. Why do I feel empty? Why does my heart ache? Why is my mind so restless? Because we are on the road to despair. You only have to look at the faces in a doctor's waiting room 
or read the newspaper or watch the evening news to know that. And it is here today on the road to despair as we make our mournful way that we meet the Lord of life in the gospel. In January 2001, Simone and I stood in Scott's church in Melbourne on our wedding day. Our plans had been changed and we were there in a small family setting in that large empty church. I had been diagnosed with cancer. I just had surgery and was about to go into hospital for months of treatment. The particular cancer I had was described as the most aggressive human cancer known to medicine. As we recited our vows, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, I was carrying a tumour that was doubling in size every day. As much as we enjoyed our wedding day, those who were there feared it was really just a rehearsal for the funeral to follow not far down the track. We spent our first months of our married life in a hospital room in the closed haematology ward of the Alfred Hospital. There was a sense that we were like those Londoners in 1665 behind a door marked with a red cross and with the words written, Lord have mercy on us. And after many dark and difficult days, he did. In due course, the cancer went into remission and we returned home. Because of this experience, something Simone and I began to discuss quite early in our married life was the subject of our funerals. Every now and then we think through what might be appropriate and we update each other. I've thought that when that day comes, and it will come unless the Lord returns, I've thought that I would like my coffin to be carried out of the church as people sing the hymn by Samuel Francis, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of his love, leading onward, leading homeward to that glorious rest above. That has been my experience in this world. And that is how I will go into eternity, carried on the deep, deep love of Jesus. And I want everyone to know that this is the promise of the gospel, that Jesus is such a mighty saviour that we can go into eternity led by the Lord of life. When Simone and I first learned of my diagnosis, we sat down together and read Psalm 25 and verse 10. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. Not just some of the paths, but all of the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. We knew because God said that somehow even this path of cancer and entering into marriage with this cloud over us, somehow even this was a mercy of the Lord. The road to the cemetery, the road to despair outside Nain was turned into a path of mercy when the Lord of life met a funeral procession. Why did Jesus raise this man? Was it because longer life in this world is what we all need? Was that the point? Is that what Jesus offers us? No. The reason Jesus raised him from the dead was for the sake of the widow. He had compassion on her so that she would have someone to share her home and to provide for her. And it was also to demonstrate that what Jesus tells us is certainly true. How do we know that Jesus is the Lord of life, that we can trust him to raise us when we die into the life to come? How can we know that? How can we see that? Have you been there? How can you tell? 
Well, the reason we can believe this is because Jesus raised people from the dead in this world. And most of all, because he himself was raised from the dead. When I was lying in my hospital bed more than 19 years ago, the key reason I had to trust in Jesus was that the Bible says he has power over death. He had been there and come back. He hadn't just stepped into death and disappeared with the parting words, well, trust in me, follow me if you if you're game. No, he had gone into death and come back. And because of this, I know that he could make me well, if that was his will, or he could take me to my heavenly home. And either in his care was a path of mercy. At that time, I wanted to continue my life in this world. I wanted to be here for my wife, Simone, and to serve the Lord in gospel work. But when the time does come for me to depart this world, when I die, I don't want to be raised back to this life. I don't want the miracle of Nain. I want the greater miracle that it points to that Jesus can and will raise his people into the life to come. It used to be said in the days of the Roman Empire, of course, that all roads lead to Rome. However, when it comes to the nature of life in this world, all roads lead to despair. This world offers us no hope, no comfort, and no answers. And the worst of all, it ends in death. And yet the psalmist says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy. He changes the road to despair into the path of mercy. And how do we know this? Because he met a poor widow on the way to bury her son outside Nain. Where are you today, my friend? Along that road to despair. We are constantly surprised that we experience pain, that we feel emptiness, that we face suffering. And yet, this is the nature of life in this world. We shouldn't be surprised. This is all the world can give, whether you live in a 17th century plague or in 21st century prosperity. And yet, today... In the message of the gospel, we are met by the Lord of life. He and he alone can change our road of despair into his path of mercy. In our passage in Luke 7, we're told how the people were filled with awe and praised God. They said, God has come to help his people. Can you say that today? Can you say, God has come to help me? Now I know that this is what he was doing in Jesus. He was coming into the world, into my world, into my life to help me. He was coming to take my sin to the cross. He was coming to die my death in my place. He was coming to rise again for me to bring me into his kingdom. He is my hope. He is my comfort. He is my joy. Today, on the road to despair, I stand before the Lord of life. I meet him. I trust him. I follow him. I rest in him. And I celebrate real and meaningful and endless life with him forever. Let us pray. 7.8 billion people on this planet and each one left to themselves on their own road to despair. And you, O oh Lord, have been pleased to meet us today on ours and so many others around the world. May the miracle of Nain 
enter not merely into our bodies, but into our souls. May we be translated from death to everlasting life. And may our testimony be that in 2020, in the year of the pandemic, God has come to help his people. God has come to me in Jesus. He has come to help me and to lead me forth on his path of mercy. Amen. Won't you lift up your heart and receive the blessing of God? We have this promise. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.